The starting point includes a font folder, prefab folder, and a textures folder. In the textures folder are all the sprite sheets for our character's different features. To use sprite sheets in Unity, you have to set the sprite mode to multiple, and then click on the sprite editor button to slice the image into multiple sprites. As you can see, I've already done this for this example. So to start getting the character set up, I'll create an empty game object and name it character. Then right click on the game object and add another empty game object named face. Attach a sprite renderer to this and assign one of the face sprites. Make the face smaller and then select the character and drag it up so there's enough space for the character's body to fit underneath it. Right click on the face, add an empty game object and name it hair. Attach a sprite renderer and assign one of the hair sprites. Scale and position the hair so that it sits on the character's head. And then try assigning some of the other hairstyles to make sure they all fit. Set the hair's order and layer to 2. Now I'm going to repeat the process for the eyes, nose, and mouth. Make sure that the order and layer for each of these is 1. When you're finished setting up the face, select the character object, add a component, and type Feature Manager to create a new c -sharp script. The Feature Manager is going to have a list of all the features that it manages, so we're going to make another class that defines a single feature. Under the Feature Manager class, create a public class feature. This class will represent an individual feature, it'll store and manage all the sprites for that feature, as well as the sprite renderer that displays the feature in the scene. Add system.serializable above the class to serialize it so that we can see it in the inspector. A public string ID will store the name of the feature's sprite sheet in the textures folder so that we can easily find it and load all the sprites from it into an array. Public int cur index represents the index of the current sprite inside a public sprite array choices which holds all the different sprites of any given feature. Finally, a public sprite renderer renderer is the sprite renderer in the scene that's responsible for displaying the feature. The constructor will take in a string and a sprite renderer and will set the ID and renderer variables in the class to the parameters given. Now create a public void update feature and call it in the end of the constructor. The update feature function will fill the choices array and this is where the ID comes in handy. You may have noticed that everything in the starting point was in a resources folder. Doing this allows us to use the resources.load functions, so the way to load all the sprites into the choices array is by saying resources.loadAll, pass in the type, which is sprite, and then pass in the path, which in this case is in parentheses, textures, forward slash, plus id. So if after doing that the choices array is null, or even if the renderer is null at this point, we're just going to return. Now we need to make sure that the cur index is in bounds so we won't get an error when trying to set the sprite. The interface is going to have a next and previous button that either increments or decrements the cur index variable, and this is how the player can pick which choice they want. So for this reason, we need to add some extra checks to determine whether the player has incremented or decremented too far and exceeded the bounds of the choices array. So if cur index is less than zero, meaning the player hit previous while the index was already zero, then we're going to jump to the end of the array by setting the cur index to choices.length minus one. However, if the cur index is greater than or equal to the length of the array, meaning the player hit next while the index was already on the last choice, we'll jump to the beginning by setting the cur index to zero. Now that we've made sure that choices exists, the sprite render exists, and the cur index is in bounds, we can say render.sprite is equal to choices cur index. And this will update the sprite render in the scene to display the proper sprite. The feature class is all set up, so let's return to the feature manager. Add a public list of features and name it features. Right click on the list and resolve the problem. Then add a public int cur feature which represents what feature the player has currently selected. Get rid of the start and update function. We'll need a void load features and a void save features. 
as well as avoid on enable that calls load features. Before I forget, add execute and edit mode before the feature manager class so that the functions like on enable and update will still be called if we're not playing. Since on enable is calling load features, we'll need on disable to call save features. Inside load features, initialize the list of features, then add a new feature to the list, passing in face as the ID. Double check to make sure that what you're passing in is the exact name of the image in the textures folder, and then pass in transform.findchild. Once again, check the name of the child you're looking for. In this case, it's also called face. And finally, get the sprite render component from it since that's what the constructor is looking for. If you've done everything correctly, you should see the face feature show up in a list of features on the characters feature manager. Back in Visual Studio, hit Ctrl X to cut this line and then paste it twice. Change the second one's ID to hair. Since I know hair is a child of face, we'll need to add find child hair after find child face. Then do the same thing for the eyes and the mouth. If you've done everything right, then you should see all the features on your character switch to their default values when you go into Unity. If not, then you've most likely made a spelling mistake somewhere. We're going to finish the load features and save features functions after we've implemented the interface. Before we can implement the interface though, we're going to set up some public functions in the feature manager. We're going to have a button representing each feature, and the onClick function for each button needs to change the current feature that the player is editing. So we'll make a function to do this and call it setCurrent. It's going to take an int index, and it needs to be public so that we can call it from other scripts. If features is null, just return, but otherwise it'll set cur feature to the index passed in. There's also going to be a next button and a previous button on the interface that allows the player to go through all the choices of the current feature being edited. So make a public void next choice that will once again just return if features is null. If features isn't null, it will increment the cur index of the cur feature in features. Public void previous choice will be the same, except it'll decrement the cur index of the current feature. Those are all the functions we'll need, so go back into Unity and let's start setting up the interface. Create a canvas, and then a panel inside of the canvas. Set the panel's rec transform to stretch along the bottom by shift clicking and alt clicking the bottom stretch option. Change the height to 100. Name this panel navigation, then right click on it and add a button. Make the button stretch along the left, once again by shift clicking and alt clicking on the option. Then set the X position to 10, the top to 10, width to 100, and the bottom to 10. Name the button previous, and then change the text to a less than sign, and customize it however you'd like. Now duplicate the previous button, change the name of the copy to next, alt click and shift click on the right stretch option this time, set the position to negative 10, top to 10, width to 100, and bottom to 10. Then change the text to a greater than sign. Next, we're going to make a text that will display the name of the selected choice. This text should be a child of navigation. Alt-click and shift-click on the option that makes the anchors stretch over the entire parent, then center the alignment of the text. Set the left to 120, the top to 15, the right to 120, and the bottom to 15. Change the font if you want, and make the size a little larger. That's it for the navigation panel, so the next thing we'll need is a container for the feature buttons. Right click on the canvas and create empty. Name this features, since it's going to serve as the parent of the feature buttons. Alt click and shift click on the option to set the pivot and position to the top left. Set the height to zero. Now we'll set up the prefab for feature buttons, so right click on features, go to UI, and select button. Align the button to the top left of its parent as well. Set the width and height to 75. Then assign the normal color and highlighted colors to something more distinct. Delete the text child of the button and instead add an image child. This image will display the current choice, so in order to set it up, assign any feature sprite for reference. Check the preserve aspect and then shift click and alt click to make the image stretch across its entire parent. Set the padding on all sides to 10. It should be fitting nicely within the button now. Name the button Feature Button and the image Feature Image. Then grab the button and drag it up into your Prefabs folder. 
You can delete it from the scene, but leave the features object. With the canvas selected, add a component and type in UI Manager to create a new c -sharp script. The UI Manager is going to need a private Feature Manager variable to have access to the functions we set up earlier, and a private text description text to store the text on the navigation panel and update it to show the name of the current choice. Since we know there's only one feature manager in the scene, we can initialize the variable by calling find object of type feature manager. And then initialize the description text by finding it in the hierarchy using transform.findchildnavigation.findchild, pass in whatever your text child is named, and then get the text component of it. Now we'll find the next and previous buttons in the hierarchy and add listeners so that they call the proper function in the feature manager. To do this for the previous button, we'll say transform.findchildnavigation.findchildprevious.getComponentButton.onClick.addListener and then use a lambda expression to call the function we want to execute when the button is clicked. Then cut it and paste it twice. Change the second one to find the child named next and call the next choice function instead. You'll see I'm getting an error when I try to test it because I passed in the wrong name of the description text. So after fixing that, you can see the next and previous buttons are working as intended. The description text should show the ID of the current feature, like face for example, and the number representing which choice is currently selected. So in update, say desktext.text is equal to manager.features and then we need to access the manager.current feature and then its ID. Plus, in quotes, add a space and a number sign. Plus manager.features, access the current feature again, and then access its current index. By default, it's displaying the first choice as number zero. So I'm just gonna change it to show the current index plus one. Now add a public rec transform button prefab, and then in Unity, find the prefab we set up and drag it into this field. When the game starts, I want a button to display for each feature in the feature manager. So create a separate void function called initialized feature buttons, and a private button list named buttons to store them. In the initialize feature buttons function, initialize buttons as a new list. Define a float height and set it to button prefabs rec dot height, and a float width set to button prefabs rec dot width. Then make a for loop that loops through the manager features count. For each loop, we're going to be instantiating a copy of the prefab, but since we also need to make changes to it, we have to temporarily store this instantiated object. So even though the objective is to set the button component, we still need to manipulate the rec transform of the button before anything else. So the easiest way to do this is by storing it as a rec transform initially. So rec transform temp, and immediately after declaring it, we'll initialize it by calling instantiate, passing in the type of prefab, and then passing in the prefab itself. This is also why we store the prefab as a rec transform instead of a game object or a button. We're going to need to know the index of each button, so set temp's name to i.toString. Set its parent to transform.findChildFeatures.getComponentRecTransform. Then reset the rec transform by setting its local scale to new vector 111 and its local position to new vector 000. Now that it's reset, to set the actual size and position, call set, inset, and size from parent edge. Pass in the left edge, the left inset is 0, and for the size, it's going to be the width. We have to do this again for the height, so cut this line and paste it twice. Change the second edge to top, the top inset to i times height, and for the size, pass in height. Each feature button should call the set current function when clicked, so store the object's button component as a button variable, which I'll name b. 
just like we did for the previous and next button. Say b.onclick.addListener, and here we'll use a lambda expression again to call manager.setCurrent, and to pass in the index, we won't be able to just pass in i, so this is where the name comes in handy. So say int.parse, and then temp.name. Now the object is all set up and we can add it to the buttons list. When you test this in Unity, four buttons should appear and you'll notice they all have the same image. So next we're going to set up a void function called update feature buttons. This function will loop through the manager.features.count and update the button's images. For each loop, we'll set the sprite of the image at index i by finding the child and accessing its image component. So buttons i dot transform dot find child pass in what you named the image, get the image component and access its sprite, and set this equal to manager dot features i dot renderer dot sprite. Don't forget to call the update feature buttons function inside the update and then jump into Unity. When you hit play, you should see the button now displays the feature that it's linked to, and when you click on one and then use the next or previous buttons, you should see that feature change. When the next and previous button is pressed, the current feature becomes deselected. I want it to always keep the current feature button selected no matter what, so to do this, all we need to do is consistently be setting the event system selected game object to the appropriate button in the buttons list. Either manually add using Unity Engine Systems to the top of the script, or just type out event system and then right click, go to resolve and add it that way. We're going to be accessing the current variable of the event system class and calling set selected game object on it. Pass in the current feature button by saying buttons manager dot current feature dot game object. And that's it. All that's left to do is set up the saving and loading, so jump back into feature manager. At the end of the load features function, add a for loop that loops through features.count. All we need to be saving and loading is the current index of each feature, but to store it we need to associate a key with it. So make a string key equal to feature underscore plus i. Then we'll check if player prefs doesn't have the key stored yet, in which case we need to store it by saying player prefs dot set int, passing in the key first, and then passing in the value which is features i dot cur index. So now that we've made sure that a value for this feature is saved, we'll load it by setting features i dot cur index to player prefs dot get int and passing in the key. It is also important that you update the feature after setting its proper cur index. So now saving is similar. Inside save features, create another for loop that loops through the features dot count. Make a string variable named key and set it to feature underscore plus i, and then call player press dot set int, passing in the key, and then the value, which is again features i dot cur index. One last very important thing, make sure you call player press dot save right after the for loop. So whenever you stop playing, this function will make sure that the player press is storing all the proper values so that when it needs to load the features, it'll load all the choices the player had previously selected. Before I end this video, I'll show you how to easily add additional features. I'm going to add a shirt, so right click on the character and not the face like we did earlier, and create empty. This is literally the same exact thing we did in the beginning of the video. Name the object top and add a sprite renderer. Assign one of the shirt sprites and then resize and reposition as necessary. Now go into Feature Manager, and inside Load Features, add one more new feature to the Features list, once again making sure to pass in the exact name of the sprite sheet, and properly finding the sprite render in the hierarchy.